For rodeo fashion, we're going to start this show off with the national anthem. So if I can please get everybody to rise and remove cover and join us in singing the national anthem. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hid at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the That national anthem just got me with time to ride bareback horses, isn't it? All right, let's let's just go to the let's go to the Lord in prayer for just a second, and then we'll get started here. Father God, we just thank you, for God, for this beautiful day you've given us. Uh, we could use a little more rain to go with the wind, but we just thank you, God. We know that you'll provide and take care of us, and. We just thank you for all your blessings and thank you for the opportunity to be here, God. And this is a special day for all these inductees and their family and friends that's here to celebrate it with them. And we just uh, thank you for them. Be with us through these ceremonies and we just uh, special blessing upon the Cowboy Hall of Fame. We ask for all of these things in the name of your son and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, my name is Jim Chamley, uh, president of the board of directors here in the North Dakota Cowboy Hall of Fame. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you all, uh, fellow board members, general members, and staff, and uh, distinguished guests. And I especially want to ask, uh, Appreciate and all the media that we have here today that have been around taking interviews and so forth and I know we're on a lot of radio stations and TV stations and we thank the media for being here. Welcome. But most importantly today we're here to to recognize and welcome welcome here the class of 2017 Hall of Fame inductees, and like I said, their families and friends. We know that many of you traveled many long distances to be here, and uh, we thank you for joining us today. I had people uh, come up to me. I know we got people from Texas and California and all over the country. I'd like to express my thanks to all of our trustees uh, for your time and your dedication in determining and casting your votes for these inductees for the class of 2017. You're a very important part of this organization. It's what it's all about. Could we have our trustees throughout, from throughout the state and the country please stand to be recognized as one group? Thank you. We thank you for your time and your dedication. And you know, it's always a, a pleasure to welcome and to see our past inductees into the Cowboy Hall of Fame, be here and be part of our events and so forth. 
So if, if you are a past inductee and you are in the North Dakota Cowboy Hall of Fame, would you please stand and be recognized? All right. Appreciate you being here. You know, the very first induction ceremony of the North Dakota Cowboy Hall of Fame was held August 1st of 1998. The first class included the North Dakota champions of the rodeo, Alvin Nelson, Jim Tesher, Tom Tesher, and Dwayne Howard. In ranching, we honored Angus Jun Kennedy Jr., John Leakey, A.C. Heidenkoper, and Vic Christensen. At that time, we also had an arts and entertainment category in which we voted and inducted into the Cowboy Hall of Fame a North Dakota native and author by the name of Louis Lamore. A Special Achievement Award was also held that year, and they, the ones that were recognized in that category, and it was their 75th year of their rodeo at that time, the annual Kildeer Mountain Roundup Rodeo. So we were off to a great start all those years ago, and today, nearly 20 years later, we remain committed to our grand mission as we continue to call attention to the impressive individuals and organizations for their immeasurable contributions to North Dakota's heritage and culture, immortalizing them in our Hall of Honorees. They're important stories to be enjoyed by generation after generation. Class of 2017 and family and friends who are representing here today, this is your day. Enjoy it, bask in it, you've all earned it. So again, welcome, one and all. Thank you. Thank you, and at this time I'd like to turn the mic over to a good friend of mine and, and our MC and a board of North Dakota Cowboy Hall of Fame Board of Director, Mr. Ron Kramer. Would you welcome Ron, please? Thank you, Jim. Everybody hear me all right? It's a great day to be in North Dakota, and if your heroes have always been cowboys and cowgirls like mine have been, you're in the right place. We've got a great, great program for you today, and uh, I'm going to get started here by introducing some uh, rodeo royalty that we have with us. I've got to cheat a little bit and get my notes out so I don't uh, forget somebody and, or mispronounce a name. Um, the Queen's in attendance today, and we really thank them for being here. It's great that they uh, took time to off their busy schedules to be with us today. First of all, Miss Rodeo North Dakota, Cassidy Rasmussen. <laughs> Welcome, Cassidy. Miss Rodeo Wise Men's, Hope Evil. Thank you, Hope. Miss Rodeo North Dakota Winter Show, Karen Burston, or Kara Burston, rather. Miss Junior High Rodeo, Bailey Grove. And Miss North Dakota High School Rodeo, Kelly Nall. They'll be helping this afternoon with the, uh, with the induction ceremony as we go through the, through the induction. Yeah, I've been coming to this thing for a while, and, and, and Jim hit it. I mean, it's a day for you guys. You inductees, you earned it. It's a great day. Relish it. Have fun. We're here to have fun with you. Right now, if you were at uh, on the patio last night for the dinner and uh, all the festivities down there, 
you've already met this next guy I'm going to introduce, but a uh, fellow that needs no introduction, so it's going to be pretty easy for me. But uh, eight times, eight gold buckles, six all-around champion uh, world championships, two bull riding world championships, a man that uh, has done it all in the rodeo business. He's done a lot at, in the quarter horse business. He's a rancher, he's a husband, he's a father, he's a great man. Uh, without rodeo, I don't know where rodeo today would be without Larry Mahan. Everything he's done in his life, he's left a mark. And uh, we're proud to have him here today. And without further ado, Larry, stage is yours. Well, it is an honor to be here. And I'd like to start out, do we have any uh, veterans in the house here or current members of our military? If they're here, I'd love for you to stand up. And we thank you for your service. Thank you. Thanks to these people, we have the opportunity to enjoy the freedoms to have events like this today. I remember the first, one of the first rodeos that I went to in North Dakota, I believe it was Mandan, way back when. And I think, well, Jack Fettick was the stock contractor. And to the best of my recollection, the, the arena lights was a string of light bulbs across the arena. They had quite a few of them around there. And that was probably a good thing because, you know, you, when you go to a rodeo and you draw a horse that you don't know, well, I started talking louder, didn't I? Draw a horse you don't know. You try to get all the information that you can, and none of the other bareback riders knew this particular horse. And so I asked old Jack about this horse, and he said, well, he said, she really bucked. The last time I bucked her, he said it was about five years ago, and said she'd been running out, I think in the Badlands, he said. Maybe he was running some horses out here, and he said, I couldn't catch her for about five years. So I get on this little brown mare, and I thought, well, this would probably be okay. Well, I made about three jumps, and I those lights weren't real high, but I think I went over one of the cords that went across with the light bulbs, and that certainly got my attention. And I thought, if these bareback riders up here in this country ride these kind of horses all the time, they're going to be pretty tough to beat. But it was a, a real pleasure to start coming up to this country and rodeoing. In fact, Dennis... Uh, Came up, Dennis, I'm going to draw a blank there. Sorry, Dennis. But he had a rodeo program from uh, Dickinson, I believe, in 19, I think it was Dickinson, 1972. And I was in three events and uh, in the team roping. And it was really fun to see that he thought I'd won all three events. And I, I don't recall ever winning three events, but I will take credit for that at that rodeo. But the scores, I know in one of the events, I marked like a 62 and now... They were just, they had just recently, I think not too long before that, had changed the judging system from 65 to 85 for each judge to that, to the new system of 1 to 25 for each judge for the rider, 1 to 25 for the horse. So my excuse for those low scores is that they hadn't really learned how to use the spread yet. <laughs> but my first year to go to the national finals was in 1964, and I made it in 15th place in the bronc riding. And uh, I know it was, it was such an exciting time to all of a sudden show up there and you had your heroes there. I mean, Jim Tesher and I think Alvin was there that year. I'm not absolutely sure. But for a young kid from Oregon to go to the national finals and, and uh, hear his name in the same group of bronc riders as those guys was, was quite an honor. And especially thinking that we were having, we were exposed to that much money the go-arounds that year paid $364, I believe. And now they're paying, I think, over $20,000. So, uh, and I've said many, uh, people have asked me, said, what's the biggest uh, change in rodeo? And I said, well, it's the amount of money that you win. I said, my biggest year was in 1973, and I won 63000 I believe. And now they're winning 200000 300000 I mean... So my wife, Julianne, who's much uh, smarter than I am when it comes to numbers, she said, let me tell you about that 63,000 with inflation. She said, in this day and age, that's worth over 300,000. And I thought, well, 
what did I do with all that money? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I said last night, I said, you know, people say, well, how'd you get started in the rodeo game? Well, of course, that I've always loved horses, and I went to my first kid's rodeo when I was about 12 years old, and I won six dollars in a belt buckle, and I'd mentioned this last night, that that, that belt buckle from Redmond, Oregon is in the Pro Rodeo Hall of Fame. And by the end of that next week, I'd spent all the money. I spent about half of it on beer and girls, and I just wasted the rest of it. But uh, that was probably a good investment. But it's such an honor to be here with, with such a fine group of people who are being inducted into the hall. And again, as Jim had mentioned, anybody that, that is inducted into a hall of fame uh, has the respect of their peers, but the contributions that they've made to the sport or the lifestyle that the Western culture and lifestyle that we have a chance to enjoy in this day and age, uh, it's a real honor for them to, to be inducted in, into the North Dakota Cowboy Hall of Fame. And this Hall of Fame, if I'm sure most of you have been there, but it's one of the finest that I've ever been to. And again, to keep the, the culture and the heritage alive is, uh, is something that that is so important in this day and age. And there was a gentleman there today that I think he does a, a Teddy Roosevelt gig on the corners around town here, and he gave me a card, and I love what it said. It says, do what you can with what you have where you are. And uh, Teddy Roosevelt obviously paid a, played a huge part in the, in the popularity of this country and has made great contributions during this time. And, you know, our Western culture is something that that really boils down to it, its hard work, discipline, self-reliance, independence, family, community, and the Lord, and that's what made this great country of ours. So we're so blessed in this day and age, even with all the chaos that's going on out in the different parts of the world, that we can still enjoy everything that this fine country has to offer. And I'd mentioned last night that that... The rodeo game to me, it, it afforded me the ability to go into, into a lot of different areas. Uh, we were in the clothing business for quite a while, and we still do Western hats. And, and, but the bottom line, it was, a, it was a great way to avoid responsibility because eight seconds is a lot easier than eight hours a day. Or for you guys that are real ranchers and you ranch up here in the winter, I think eight hours would be an easy day for you. When they talk about getting out and feeding cattle at 30 degrees below zero, uh, my ranch would probably make the headlines, all the Mayhans cows died last night. <laughs> I mean, that, that's a tough one. And uh, Brenda Lee, I mean, she went out there and she did a lot of waving to all the people. And then all of a sudden, there was a young cowboy that, uh, I don't remember what year they got married. Do you remember, Brenda, what year that was? 88. How many years did uh, that husband of yours follow you around proposing to you? I mean, I've, heard, I've heard some stories on that, but I mean, Dee Pickett, he was relentless, wasn't he? You know, and, that, and that's why he was the world's champ, because he, was, he had set a goal, and that's what rodeo is all about. You have to set a goal and try to reach that goal each and every time you ride into that box or climb over that chute gate. And uh, of course, my job at that time was about eight seconds at a time, and I'm sure that that uh, Dee probably had to work longer than eight seconds. I mean, working those timed events is tough. You know, I'm sure you roped some steers in 10 and 15 seconds and still won money, didn't you? Now, did you hold any arena records? I'd love for you all to meet Dee Pickett. He was one of my heroes. Dee, would you come up here for just a minute? Come on up here. Come up here. I want, come on up here. Now, this is one of the great world's champions right here from Napa, Idaho. And... He won a lot more money winning the all-around than I did. How much did you win your big year? Uh, I won a little over 30000 at the finals that year. 30000 at the finals. Did you get on 30 head of bucking horses and bulls, or how many head of cattle did you have to run? Uh, you know, I, I, I felt like I roped good enough. I didn't have to ride bucking horses. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> How would you do in the steer wrestling? No, no, no. Jerry Bigley told me something once. That, uh, Speak up here. Step a little closer. Jerry Bigley told me once, uh, you know, he was a 
bull rider in my area. He, he said, you know, your dad must have recognized early on that you were going to be way too big to be a top bull rider. I said, that, that's exactly right. <laughs> Do you rope anymore? Nope. Why? Uh, I just uh, moved on to uh, business endeavor, and, and that takes up my time, and I'm... Uh, I can't really tell you why, except I, I can't tell you why. <laughs> this in my, during the time that I had the opportunity to watch him in his heyday, he was one of the great horsemen, and, and I know there's a lot of young cowboys out here and cowgirls that, that love to rope. How important is horsemanship in the events that you competed in? Uh, I think horsemanship is uh, the utmost. Uh, I think it. I think it gets overlooked way too much in the rodeo business. People focus on uh, the ability to be able to to rope and tie and all that goes with it. But uh, I, to me, the horsemanship was was what I enjoyed the most. And I think I think it's I think it's overlooked. Uh, and I, I I think there should be more emphasis put on it. What did you have going for you that? that Brenda Lee liked to the point that she finally said after all those years that you chased her around that she said, yes, I will marry you. I mean, what was so special about you? There was absolutely nothing special about me. <laughs> there was something very special about her. And uh, as you know, in the rodeo business, you have to have a certain amount of uh, determination. That, that's what I had. One of the great champions right here, D. Pitt. Hey, thanks for coming up, D. He was one of my heroes in that timed event world. <laughs> you know, once in a while, an ornery side of me just shows up. $30,000 at the NFR. My biggest NFR, I get on 30 head of you know, 10 bucking horses, 10 bulls, 10 bareback horses. And I, my big win that year in 73, and I was the big winner at the finals, was $6,000. Now, you threw a rope. How, did you, you went in two events that year, right? 20 times, and you get $30,000. And the girl, no justice. There is no justice. Well, I'll tell you what, it's been a great ride, and I hope that everybody here has had an opportunity to go to the North Dakota Hall of Fame down here because it is, it's a slice of history and they're keeping it alive, and it takes a lot of support from a lot of people to make this happen, and, and Rick Thompson, Jim, and everybody involved on the committees that, that makes that possible, uh, I take my hat off to you because it is one of the best I've ever seen. You can spend days in there just going around and seeing what it was like back when it was really tough. But one thing about country like this, I mean, it might have been tough back then because they didn't have tractors, and, but it, it is probably just almost as tough right now. And, and I have the book of Fran's, uh, my heroes have always been cowboys, and she gave Julianne and I a copy last night, and I stayed up for hours reading it, and, and uh, I'll tell you one thing, I'm, I'm not tough enough to be a North Dakota cowboy. I, this, is a, this, was a, this is a tough deal up here in the winter. But what a piece of heaven and such a beautiful place you all live in, and, and Rick said I could stay up here for a couple of hours, but I'd have to re rewrite some of the same stories I told last night. But one thing that I'm sure you all don't know, you were looking at, you know, bull steer wrestlers are usually pretty big guys. And I like to rope. I never was big enough to rope calves because back then they roped calves that were big. And uh, they bulldog steers that were about the size of some of the bulls that you see in the bull riding. But I was the 1962 steer wrestling champion in Arizona. What do you mean, oh no? There was three of us in it. <laughs> there was one kid that was a steer wrestler. And you know there's a lot of camaraderie in sportsmanship in, in the sport of rodeo and people will use, ride somebody else's horse. I mean, I'm sure uh, D has loaned his horse out, not for nothing. I think you get 25% if they win on your horse. 
And I don't know if it was because there wasn't any money hardly to win there in that steer wrestling, but that steer wrestling kid, he would not let me or this other young man ride his horse. So this old team roper that I knew, he said, well, Mahan, he said, you can get on this old team roping horse here and said, I know you can run him by one and jump that steer. Said, he said, you'll do all right. Well, this horse would not run by that steer. So I ran that steer around the arena. They didn't have a time limit on it. I know I probably run him around there for about a minute or two, and I finally got him in the corner, and I just jumped off the horse. He'd stopped, and he was standing there, and I caught him and threw him down, and I was the only one of the three guys that, that day that caught his steer. But it was two go-arounds, and the next go-around, the same thing happened, and I did the same thing, and I was the only guy to catch two steers, but it doesn't matter. As long as you're the champion when it's all over, that's all that's important. And Brad Germanson is also one of my young heroes, and I think you all can be very proud of him. Uh, he told me that he won the Saddle Rock Riding Championship 10 times, but uh, young man John was interviewing him a while ago, and, and uh, Brad tried to tell him that he'd won it 10 times, and he says, no, he said, I've done my homework. He said, you only won it four times, Brad. And for you all that don't know Brad, he usually doesn't exaggerate like, like that, but uh, no, but one of the all-time great saddle bronc riding champions right here in North Dakota, and proud to call him a friend of mine, Brad uh, Germanson. He's probably out in his pickup drinking beer right now. Are you around here, Brad? Uh, where are you, Brad? Brad, would you come up here for a minute, please? He's going to. I'm going to. We're going. He's going to do a little bit of a bashful act for you here. But I do have a couple of questions I'd like to ask you. Four times saddle bronc riding champ of the world, Brad Germanson. Brad, I don't have any questions. I just want you to go to talking because I've run out of things to say. <laughs> <laughs> How many times did you win Cheyenne? Uh, twice. How many times did you win the finals, Bronc Riding? Twice. Yep. How tough was it to, when you finally got to that point that you realized that it was time to hang it up? It was, <clears throat> it was real hard to, to uh, walk away from it, but... Uh, I just felt like I wasn't doing the job that I had. I couldn't keep it up any longer. I had family and ranch and got spread too thin. So uh, it, was, it was hard to not enter, but it, 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 was, uh, it was just hard to not pick up the phone every day and look at the sports news and enter what you wanted to go to. And uh, it took a couple of years to really get over that. You know. Was it harder to stay on them? than it was when you uh, were at the top of your game? No, well, harder to stay on the... <laughs> the Bronx. Oh, no, yeah. It was harder to, to not enter than it was to stay on, yes. Tell us about what you're doing on television right now with RFD. Oh, well, it's, uh, it's called Special Cowboy Moments, and I'm sure everybody, or a lot of you here have, have seen it. Uh, uh, Kevin Holton has a program, and, and I've just been part of about three or four episodes, and... Uh, it's it's really a nice thing because it's on RFD now and, and gets you know it was showed locally here in the state for uh, for a few months and or a year and and now it's I, I get calls a lot of calls of from all over the United States uh, people picking up and and getting tuned into that show and uh, they they really enjoy it and I think it's uh, great for all of the Western way of life. And he's doing a great job. I hope you all get a chance to catch it. Brad, thank you. One of my heroes when I was a kid right here. I grew up watching him ride Bronx. <laughs> but it's an honor to be here and, and such a treat to, uh, to be able to spend some time in Medora. And again, congratulations to everybody that's involved with this North Dakota Cowboy Hall of Fame because it is the culture and heritage that, uh, that is alive and well in this part of the country, or at least it seems like it is to me, and, and it takes a lot of hard work, and, and if you have a chance, get by the hall and do anything you can to support it, because these things are not uh, inexpensive to operate, but 
Congratulations to all of you. Now we're going to move on with the important part of this program. Thank you all. God bless you very much. Thank you. How about that? Wasn't that great? Um, like Larry said, now we're going to move into the important part of this program, and that's recognizing the class of 2017. Before we do that, I'd like to recognize the sponsors, the folks that have, that have been good enough to uh, sponsor the induction ceremony today. Four Bears Casino in Newtown, North Dakota. First State Bank right here in Medora. Valley Meat Supply in Valley City and Stockman's Livestock in Dickinson, North Dakota. Let's give our sponsors a big round of applause for all they do. This morning we had a trustees breakfast down on the patio at the hall and the White Earth Valley Saddle Club sponsored the breakfast. Let's give White Earth Valley Saddle Club a big thanks for doing that. We had a sponsor's dinner uh, Larry Mahan supper sponsors, and I want to recognize those folks, Kay Nelson, Brad and Jackie Germanson, Fred Sorensen, Joe and Sandy Frenzel, Phil Baird, Jim and Gail Chamley, and Pete and Sylvia Fredericks were meal sponsors or sponsored Larry Mahan to be here. So let's give those folks a round of applause. We've got uh, inductee posters that are new this year. We've got a hundred of those and they're numbered from one to a hundred. They're for, on sale right over here. And Rick, what's the cost of those? $30. $30 for the poster and there's 10 canvas posters and they are $120. $120. So limited number, uh, they're right over here. And Larry mentioned that, you know, membership is what makes the Cowboy Hall of Fame work and pays the bills. So if you're not a member and you'd like to be, we've got membership applications available on site. And please uh, join and, and support the hall. At this time, uh, I'd like to bring up, um, we'll start our induction ceremony with the Great Westerner category. And that's Clarence Parker, and to uh, introduce Clarence Parker, um, Connie Sunby. There she is. I was looking for you over there by Ed, oh, yeah. but you're left him by himself. So. Yeah. Good afternoon. Clarence H. Parker was born on March 12, 1873 in Minot, North Dakota. He was widely recognized as a pioneer rancher. He was considered, considered North Dakota's main breeder of buffalo and was also well known for his cattle and his horses, the later of which he entered in races. In the early 1900s, Parker maintained what was believed to be the privately largest owned buffalo herd in the Midwest, and perhaps the largest in the United States. His property included the C.P. Ranch in Renville County and the C. Bar P. Ranch, which continues to operate today in Williams County. We're honored to have with us today the two owners of those properties currently. The Renville County property was owned by the Eckert family, and the Williams County property is owned by John Hovde and it was very wonderful to have them with us today. One of Minot's most prominent businessmen, Parker imported registered sires with highly rated bloodlines to build up his herd, the product of which he served to guests of the hotels he owned. Ranchers, families, friends, and travelers enjoyed the buffalo and the beefsteaks at his Leland Parker and Clarence Parker hotels. The hotels also hosted conventions, including those for the North Dakota Stockmen's Association. Parker took great pride, we hear, in his acquaintances and association with members of the Mandan, Hadatso, and Arikara tribes, also with ranchers, cowboys, and others. Though known for his business, 
Parker remained foremost a rancher at heart. He was especially proud of his membership in the Mouse River Cattlemen's Organization. Parker was an experienced horseman, a cowboy, and a former professional jockey, having raced horses in his youth. He was a crack shot, excelling in big game hunting and trap shooting, displaying his trophies in his hotels. He owned a remarkable collection of guns, cowboy paraphernalia, Native American artifacts, and relics of the Western lifestyle. We are proud to say that those artifacts from his collection are on display at Minot State University. He was known affectionately as Colonel Parker, having been appointed Colonel on the staff of Governor John Moses. Parker served as President and Chairman of American State Bank and served on the Minot City Council for many years. He was instrumental in building the Northwest, Northwest Fair Association, forerunner of the North Dakota State Fair in Minot, and he served on that board from its formation in 1922 until his death in 1953. We are proud to have his great-grandson, David Parker, and his wife, Susan, who came all the way from Denton, Texas, to accept this award on behalf of his great-grandfather, Clarence H. Parker, the Great Westerner. On behalf of the Parker family, I'd like to thank you so much for this great, great honor. I'd like to thank my wife, Susan, for marrying this Norwegian cowboy. <laughs> we came from Denton, Texas, and uh, it's 110 heat index down in Denton right now. We had to make a quick run to the boot barn for a long sleeve coat for Susan. <laughs> but thank you for the, this great honor, the Hall of Fame, uh, Rick Thompson, I'd like to specially recognize Eloise uh, Ogden for all she did. This was not possible without her. Thank you, Connie, for this great introduction. Uh, it's just such a privilege to be here and back in North Dakota. Uh, North Dakota, and you all know this, but uh, let me remind you that this is the greatest state in the country. And what makes it great are the people, and I honestly say that. It's just, you get that great feeling coming back here. A beautiful, beautiful state, and actually more beautiful than where we live in Texas, which is hard to say. But uh, Clarence Parker was truly a pioneer. He was a businessman, a rancher, a hotelman, and a sportsman. We heard about the hotels. I was especially amazed that uh, two presidents stayed at the uh, hotel. Uh, the world champion, lightweight champion of the world boxer was there. Uh, great, great dignitaries that passed through there. He was a hunter. He brought in people to hunt all the time. They had these great hunts with the buffalo. Um, two things kind of stood out to me about Clarence Parker as I researched him more. Uh, one was his love and his friendship with the Native American people in North Dakota. And one example was Chief, Chief Dragswolf, who was the chief um, of the Fort Berthold Reservation. He invited the chief to his house and his family for a big buffalo hunt and a feed. And this was the first buffalo that the chief had shot in 52 years. And uh, he was a young uh, warrior in North Dakota on the plains the last time he shot a buffalo. But he always, I think, reveled in that friendship with the Native Americans. Uh, the other thing that stood out to me was his love of the buffalo and bringing back the buffalo to North Dakota. You know, we all knew that uh, in North Dakota, the buffalo were extinguished by the time, you know, in the, what, 20s or before. And he had, I believe, this vision to bring back the buffalo to North Dakota. And he saw them as these majestic, beautiful animals. And I'll never forget yesterday, Susan, as we drove in, and as you all know, when you come down 94, you get close to Medora, we look to the right, and beautiful buffalo laying in the grass and grazing, and what beautiful animals they were. And I thought, you know, if Clarence Parker was here today, 
You know, in heaven, I'm sure he's looking down and saying, the buffalo are back in North Dakota. And he'd be a very, very happy man at that because he died in 1953 and they brought him back in 56. But he would have been a very happy man. So thank you, the Cowboy Hall of Fame. Thank you so much for this great honor. Uh, I'd like to say uh, God bless all the people in attendance here and God bless the great state of North Dakota. The next category is the Cowboy Long Rider. And the inductee in that category is Paul Christensen and Walter Peel will uh, read the bio. Here's Walter. What a nice turnout today. I've been a uh, North Dakota Cowboy Hall of Fame board member for over 20 years. Uh, I came on the board when Dr. George Christensen went off the board, one of the original members. When we added the Long Rider Award to the hall, it was asked by some on the board, they said, well, what would be a Long Rider? Willard Schnell, the great Willard Schnell, replied, the Long Rider is someone who rode the big circle, someone who covered lots of ground. Paul Christensen truly fits that description. Now every one of us has known someone who's dedicated to their particular cause. I was fortunate for over 20 years to have known, worked with, and established a close friendship with Paul. Rodeo and Western Americana go back to my childhood, my family's rodeo stock and production company with the NDRA, the Rough Riders, the Little Bridges, other associations in Minnesota and South Dakota and it put me in contact with some of the best and most dedicated Western folk. People like the Jorgensons of Watford City, the Myers of Berthold, the Halls from Newtown, Lee Sellen, Bud Anderson, Sonny Air. I mean, some of the best and the most dedicated. Paul was one of the best and he was just as dedicated. He never competed in rodeo himself but you could not find a more dedicated volunteer for anything Western. And I think uh, the great YMCA uh, rodeo in Minot, uh, the fruits of his father's work and the fruits of Paul's work uh, will tell you that kind of dedication and uh, the uh, attendance here today of members of uh, the wonderful uh, Wise Men's Rodeo Club. Whether it be rodeos, Queen contests, horse shows, youth horse camps, or if there's a rancher that needed an extra hand in this part of the country, it might have been the Mossers up on Government Creek, might have been down at uh, Logan Camp with uh, the Hansons. Paul was always there, he was always ready, and he was always enthusiastic. Paul passed away far too young as a direct result of a horse riding accident. And if Paul could tell us today, I'm sure he would say, I went out with my boots on. This is exactly the way Paul would have wanted it. Paul exemplifies the exact character our Long Rider Award was tailored for. He rode the big circle for all things Western and all things the North Dakota Cowboy Hall of Fame stands for. Barb Semroff will accept for the family. My husband Marv and I would like to thank our good friend Walter Peel for that wonderful introduction of my brother. I'd like to thank our son Chris from Sioux Falls and daughter Amy and her husband Stu from Minneapolis, as well as many other family members, wise men, and friends who have traveled here today to celebrate this honor for my brother Paul. Thank you to the District 5 trustees and Eloise Ogden for nominating Paul. But most importantly, thank you to the Hall of Fame trustees for honoring Paul. Our family has a long history with the Hall of Fame, 
Our dad, Dr. George Christensen, was inducted in 2001 in the Leaders of Ranching and Rodeo category, and our rodeo, the Minot Wiseman's Rodeo, was inducted in 2003 in the Special Achievement category. The idea for the Cowboy Hall of Fame started after a reunion in 1994 of past competitors at the Wiseman's Rodeo in Minot. Phil Baird and Evelyn Nguyen's recognized that night the history that was present and that something had to be done to preserve that history. We now have a wonderful hall and organization dedicated to this preservation. Paul was a very proud member and chair of the Hall of Fame trustees. He was committed to the preservation of North Dakota's Western lifestyle, culture, and history. He was a lifelong educator and loved the Western way of life. He was anxious to share this love with the many children at Triangle Y Camp when he was a counselor and riding instructor. Hundreds, if not thousands, of campers received their first introduction to horsemanship from Paul. He thoroughly enjoyed being the advisor for the Andrus High School Rodeo Club and coaching the academic decathlon team in El Paso, Texas, where he was a teacher for many years. He shared his knowledge of the history and traditions of the Western way of life with his students at the Burdick Job Corps Center in Minot. He was always inviting novice cowboys and cowgirls to countless cattle drives, roundups, brandings, and trail rides to introduce them to the things that he loved. Paul dedicated many years to the Miss Rodeo North Dakota pageant board. He understood the importance of these young women who do an outstanding job representing our state and rodeo. Several of our past rodeo queens have said that he always told them individually that they were his favorite but now they found out that he has told that to all of them. <laughs> Paul was very knowledgeable about Native American history and shared this knowledge with his students, Y campers, and many other groups. Our family would like to thank you so very much for this wonderful honor. Paul would be so humbled to be joining our father in the Hall of Honorees. Thank you very much. Next inductee on the program is the pre 1940s ranching category, and the honoree in that category is Herb Birdsell. And <laughs> Shirley wasn't even up here yet. That one was supposed to be planned for her. To recognize Herb is Shirley Meyer. Good afternoon, everybody. It's so great to see all you old friends. Uh, one of the things I really like about the Cowboy Hall of Fame, of course, other than getting to have supper with Larry Mahan, who's now a close personal friend, everyone who was here last night ha has the right to say that if you're ever asked. He's a close personal friend. I had supper with him. So, But seriously, one of the things that I really appreciate about the Cowboy Hall of Fame and what we're doing here is the fact that when you have a family member that's nominated to go into the Cowboy Hall of Fame, you're pretty much forced to sit down and write and chronicle the history that otherwise might be, might be forgotten. It's my job here today to introduce Herb Burtzel in the pre-1940s ranching category. And although I knew Herb most of my adult life, I never really knew how many things about him until Barb had the family sit down and start writing it out. And when we did that, one of my funnest memories with this is getting to visit with my father-in-law, Daryl Meyer, and we've had so many enjoyable laughs with this just when I asked him to tell me Herb stories. And he told me this one, and I think it's okay if I share it, but he said, one time Herb was having a little bit of trouble with a horse, and so Mildred, his wife, he walked out, she walked out of the house and just handed him a gun. <laughs> so, we, so we've had a lot of fun talking about this. It wouldn't have happened, I don't think, had he not been nominated. Ranchers of the 
pre-40s era, grew up in tough times. As the saying goes, when the going gets tough, the tough gets going. Herb lived through many of those tough times, including the 30s. In spite of those tough times, Herb built a foundation that enabled his family to thrive in the farming and ranching industry. Along with Daryl Meyer, they formed the Burtzel Meyer Partnership. Their partnership gave future generations an opportunity to grow up in the life that Herb loved, raising and caring for livestock. Herb was a horseman. My favorite memories of all time are sitting in the barn at the figure four at the end of the day and just listening to the saddle horses when they start munching on their grain. Herb always made sure every horse was fed before he even thought about walking up to the house for supper. And of course, after putting in a long week's worth of work riding horseback, you jump in the vehicle and head off to the nearest rodeo or chariot race on the end of the weekend. Herb didn't worry too much about how a horse was bred. He always said, you can't ride papers. But the horses that he rode were well broke and they worked well. They could bring in a heifer out of the pasture in the middle of the night. Herb's horses would just put, get in this long, steady walk that just covered a lot of ground. You got stuff done. They weren't Doc Barr and they weren't Doc Alina. They were Buck and Susie and Albert and Jake. And if any of you happen to see Rodney Nelson around, you can ask him to tell you stories about Jake. When we had a bucking string, a lot of times our saddle horses, we had to load them up in the weekends and we bucked them. But Rodney's got a lot of stories, you can ask him about it. Oftentimes Herb only rode with one spur. I asked him about it one time and he replied, well, I figure if I can get one side of my horse to go, the other side's probably gonna come along. <laughs> Another quote from Herb that seems so important to remember, especially this year is, remember, it's always gonna rain after a dry spell. Ranchers pride themselves on their hard work ethics, honesty, integrity, and independence. Ethical, honest, integrity, independence. Those four words describe Herb Burtzel. I couldn't be pr prouder to introduce their family to you today. Thank you. Thank you, Shirley. Good afternoon, everyone. In 1956, 11 Blaisdell area ranchers met with the idea of building a rodeo arena for the youth of the community. One of these ranchers was Herb Burtzel. Herb spent more than 75 years working on the back of a horse. He achieved the dream of just about every cowboy, which is to own his own ranch. To acquire land and stock it with cattle and horses takes a good partner. Herb met his compliment in the neighbor girl, Mildred Wixer. Mildred was kind and soft-spoken. She had a toughness mixed with sensibility and understood matters on the other side of the fence line. Herb had good teachers in his parents, Edgar and Alberta Burtzel who came to North Dakota in 1902. They were bold and resourceful. They persevered and made a living from the land. Born in 1904 on the family farm north of Berthold, Herb grew up farming with horses alongside his dad and two brothers, and they were known as Burtzel Farms. Of the Burtzel brothers, Herb was the cowboy. Herb and Mildred married in 1926, and in 35 they bought a ranch southwest of Berthold. Being optimists and hard workers with their daughters, daughters, Jerry, Eleanor, and Merle, they carved out a ranching life. Ever mindful of good business, Herb and Mildred attended cattle shows such as the Valley City Winter Show and State Fair to learn and observe the developing trends and innovations in the industry. Herb's goal was his family and community. He and his brothers, Don and Leon, were instrumental in bringing power to Western Ward County. He raised his daughters as ranchers. Working hard was a natural for them. They were at home in the outdoors and in the kitchen. They promoted rodeos, were active in the North Dakota cattle women, and won in politics. He had confidence in them. Planning for the future, he kept acquiring land for their own places. In 1950, his son-in-law, Darrell, became his partner. Many young men got a start working for Herb. They must have liked him. They stayed on for years, and when they married, Herb had a place for them to live as they started their new lives. Herb knew the neighbor boy, Bill McCullough, was interested in horses, cattle, and cowboying. 
He and Mildred took Bill to watch his first rodeo. It was at Sanish or perhaps Centennial Butte. Bill saw the Teshers, Dean Armstrong, Casey Tibbs, Pete Fredericks all ride and others rope. What a treat, 100 miles from home, contestants Bill had read about. He was hooked. Of course they went home the same day. Herb shared his talent with his grandchildren as he worked with us all on horses. He didn't have any trophy buckles or saddles. He was a backbone, guiding us in our first competitive events. He took us to the horse and cattle sales. Little did we know at the time he was teaching us the skills needed to survive in life and business. Down the road they go in an old red pickup with a stock rack on and one saddle horse to the figure four ranch. At 62 and 63 years young, Herb and Mildred were two people that weren't afraid to expand. In 1968, along with the Meyer family, they purchased the figure four ranch at Watford City, North Dakota. They had some nice months learning the ranch operations. Then Mildred unexpectedly passed away. This was hard. Herb later married Daisy Haugen, who was also a widow. Now Daisy was as strong of a Republican as Herb was Democrat. You could easily find Herb and Daisy playing a highly competitive game of whist. Like all ranchers, Herb had the concern, horses, cattle, and weather. He was a 36-year member of the North Dakota Stockmen's Association. Herb grew ranching and rodeo into a family business that he passed to the next generations and is still growing today. He had the great fortune as to have lived and ranched on both sides of the river. Today there are 76 entries in the Blaisdell Youth Rodeo. What a tribute. Thank you for this great honor of inducting Herb Burtzel into the pre-1940s ranching North Dakota Cowboy Hall of Fame. How much time do I have, Bill? I got about a half hour here. You know, thank you, Barb, for getting this going. Uh, wouldn't have been for Barb, this wouldn't have happened. <clears throat> you know, Larry Mann was talking about arena records, and you know how grandpas are pretty forgiving of their grandchildren, and I was his oldest grandchild. Well, I hold an arena record at Kildare. It's about 50 years ago and 100 pounds ago, I was riding saddle bronx. And Grandpa and I went down there at amateur bronc riding at the 4th of July rodeo. And uh, those of you that remember me riding, no, it was pretty bad. In that big arena and all those people on that side hill. And I had a horse who just kind of run down the arena, it must have been, because uh, he bucked me off at the fence at the far end right at the whistle. And you, you have to run pretty fast to get to that end of the arena in eight seconds. And I wasn't really worried about a score because I usually missed my horses out, so I wasn't too worried about that. So I was walking back and buckling my shafts in front of all these 3,000, 4,000 people there. They announced my score, I had a 28. <laughs> and uh, I felt pretty bad about that. And Grandpa, he stuck up for me. He said he, he watched ride and he figured I should have been at least 30. <laughs> so that, that, you know, he, they really, he stuck up for his grandkid. Now I've announced hundreds of amateurs and, and high school rodeos and they score a lot higher now. I see a horse come out and stand in front of the buck and shoots, and the guy will score 38 with an option for a re-ride, and mine ran a quarter of a mile, for God's sakes. <laughs> you know, Herb was a cowboy. You didn't see Herb ever in a baseball cap or a pair of tennis shoes. Usually had a kind of a beat-up felt hat that was covered with oil and grease and cow manure and sweatbands, or a straw hat that was all beat to hell, and most people wouldn't want to wear, and he was always kind of proud of it. I think uh, that's the way I like to remember him. But he was a cowboy. He was probably the last guy that thought he'd end up in the Cowboy Hall of Fame. Real cowboys are like that, Larry Mahan. Well, Shirley made me say that. She did, really. <laughs> Shirley, Shirley made me say that. I would never think of that myself. You know, Herb was happiest uh, when he was horseback, whether he was heat detecting cows out on the reservation or riding up at Berthel to go get a uh, check and see if the bulls were scattered out. Uh, he always liked to do something with horses. He was getting a little older and uh, he'd start colts. He'd 
get on them down to Tronson Place, he'd cross off all these colts and ride them in a grain bin. That was before anybody heard of indoor arenas or anything. And he had one that beat him up pretty bad, and he had his billfold in his hip pocket. And he said that's what hurt him because he got a little cockeyed. And, and uh, he said this horse could really buck with all four feet hobbled and his head tied down. <laughs> and uh, the horse, a lot of you guys at rodeos, when we were putting on rodeos in the 70s, was remembering the horse was Bobby Sox. And he became bucking horse of the year about five, six years in a row, either in the bareback riding or the bronc riding. So Herb was always pretty proud that he discovered that bucking horse. He rode pretty much every day that he could. When he got older, Dennis uh, rigged up a deal. Herb had been in some horse wrecks and car wrecks over the years. and He couldn't saddle a horse, so Dennis fixed up a pulley system in the barn up at Berthold where Herb could lead his horse into the stall and let that saddle down on and get his horse saddled and had the gates all fixed so he could go out to the pasture and uh, go check cows without having to get off his horse ever. So he, he did as long as he could. I think uh, one of the things we talked about, and Shirley said uh, some of his philosophical things, like he always told you it could, uh, it's always going to rain after a dry spell. And a couple other things I like to remember him for, and I hope this doesn't offend anything, because he aimed it at me, not at anybody else in particular. He said, if I was too dumb to farm a ranch, I could always be a minister or county agent. <laughs> he didn't have too much use for either one of those. <laughs> Another thing that he said that uh, I think kind of holds true, and hope this doesn't offend anybody either, but he always uh, said, if you're going to buy horses, never buy a horse from a guy that sits in the front pew at church. <laughs> Thank you for voting, man. Appreciate it. The next category is Modern Era Ranching, and the recipient, the honoree this year is James Conley. To introduce James Conley, Sue Mosser. James Lewis Conley was born May 12th, excuse me, May 11th, 1912, at the family home in Dunn Center, North Dakota. In his early years, James lived and worked on the Two Bar Ranch at Dunn Center. During the winters of the 30s and 40s, he also worked at a cow camp on the Little Missouri River, later purchasing the Al Bukley Ranch at Golden Valley. He eventually had 10,000 head of cattle between the two ranches. James joined his father, William C. Connolly, in forming the North Dakota Stockmen's Association in 1929 and remained a lifelong member, having held terms on the board of directors and as president. Conley also served as a director for the North Dakota Farm Bureau, the North Dakota Hereford Association, was president of the North Dakota Beef Council, and was a director for the National Cattle Cattlemen's Association. He was on the board of advisors of Assumption College in Richardson and on the board at Dickinson State College. In addition, James was a charter member of the National Cowboy Hall of Fame, as well as the National, as the North Dakota Cowboy Hall of Fame. James served in the North Dakota Legislature for the 33rd and 48th districts and spoke with ease about government encroachment, imported beef, consumer demand, juvenile delinquency, and exchange programs between city and rural youth. James was honored with the North Dakota Stockmen's Association Top Hand Award in 1989. James Connolly died in Bismarck, North Dakota on August 5, 1989. To accept the honor today for James is his son, Mike. Please welcome and congratulations. Now, this isn't as long as Dean's was. Okay, it is an honor to have my dad, James L. Conley, <clears throat> nominated for an inductee into the North Dakota Cowboy Hall of Fame in the <clears throat> Modern Era Ranching Division. <clears throat> On behalf of my family, myself, and my sister, Sheila, who could not be here, 
<clears throat> who is uh, unable to be here, I would like to thank you for <clears throat> their time and the work that was involved in the nomination process. A special thank you to Kay Nelson. <clears throat> thank you so much. We are all honored. That's it. <laughs> Pre 1940s rodeo honoree is Leo Sorensen, and to introduce Leo is board member Ross Rossolvin. Thank you, Ross. Thank you, everyone, for taking time out of your schedules today to share this beautiful day with us and at the North Dakota Cowboy Hall of Fame. Uh, a tip of the hat to my fellow board members for their wonderful presentations, research, and hard work that they do year-round, if you would. And also, thank you. A round of applause for the North Dakota Cowboy Hall of Fame employees and staff who uh, put this all together and make it work so seamlessly. <laughs> Leo Sorensen is the pre-1940s rodeo uh, inductee this year. Uh, he went on his first cattle drive when he was still in grade school, and today we would say that is a non-OSHA approved cattle drive. He uh, moved cattle from Garrison, North Dakota over to the Fort Berthold Reservation. He continued to be part of uh, various cattle drives and horse roundups uh, th for, for decades in North Dakota. Uh, he started to lease land at the tender young age of 17 and began raising cattle. By 21, he was living in a one-room dugout northwest of Halliday, North Dakota. And I'm not sure if Leo was allergic to cats like I am, or if he just didn't like cats like I don't. But to take care of uh, any mice and pack rats in his dugout, he kept a six-foot uh, bull snake that he named Old Joe to keep the rodent population down. So he sounds like a really interesting guy to me. Uh, some of Leo's background includes that he was a rodeo judge at, at a lot of different rodeos across the state of North Dakota for a total of 50 years. He competed in team roping into his 70s. Uh, you got to be tough to be able to do that. When he passed away at age 91, the Garrison Rodeo Association gave silver buckles to the team ropers designed by Leo's grand nephew, Scott Sorensen, who's going to come up in a minute. And uh, Another thing I like about Leo was that he was a North Dakota resident his whole life. He was also a member of the Great Plains Indian Rodeo Association, the Galloway Breeders Association, the National Bit Spur and Saddle Association, and I understand that when he passed there was a big auction of his collection and people came from all over the world because of the quality of the things that he had amassed. Uh, he was a member of the North Dakota Rodeo Association and was one of the charter members of the 50 Years in the Saddle Club. I'm pleased to add his name as a new member of the North Dakota Cowboy Hall of Fame. Uh, Scott Sorensen, the grand nephew, could you please come up? Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Leo was my, my great uncle. And it's, uh, it's a pretty good day to have an opportunity to represent a family member who is also one of your real life heroes. Uncle Leo was <clears throat> 50 years my senior, so I can't stand here and tell you a lot of experiences we had riding and roping together. But I can tell you that he was 100% cowboy. He ate, breathed, and slept cowboy. He lived it. That's all he ever did and he did it for a long time, as his life spanned nearly a century. When I was thinking about what I should say when I got up here, <clears throat> I was taking a trip a few weeks ago. I was going out to Montana by myself, and I thought, what do people associate cowboys with? And I'm not talking about this group. I'm talking about the general public. So. Things like horses and saddles, hats, long, long sleeve western shirts and neckerchiefs, boots, bits and spurs, and possibly ropes and rifles. They all help define the cowboy, but are partly taken for granted by some of us in these modern times. <clears throat> in Leo's time, they were his tools. 
They helped him hone his skills, build his character, and gain respect as an all-around working cowboy. He would later become a relatively big collector of some of these articles. Now, <clears throat> some of you know him, some of you don't, but speaking of his character, he was one. <clears throat> and like many of us, <clears throat> excuse me, he had some noteworthy isms. Um, isms, I-S-M-S, -S, yes. I'll call them Leoisms. That is, he would often greet you with a how do, and perhaps, depending on the day, a double how do. <clears throat> now then, he would, he would likely begin any story or correspondence with well, followed by by golly, by gosh, or by God. <clears throat> and then you better have some time on your hands because it's going to it's fixing to get long. And that wasn't because it was boring or it lacked content. It was just his attention to detail and partly due to maybe the rate of delivery. And then he would simply conclude with a C, meaning now you understand. So ladies and gentlemen, you probably won't read Leo's name in any record books, or possibly any books for that matter, but he was a cowboy, and he was a good one, otherwise I would likely not be here today. And now with this in, in, induction into the North Dakota Cowboy Hall of Fame, Leo's legacy, at least in part, will be enshrined for people to share. I think if Leo were here today, he would simply say, well, by golly, thank you. This is a pretty good deal. <laughs> so on behalf of the Sorensen family and all those who shared their lives with him, I would like to congratulate my great uncle Leo Sorensen and all of the 2017 North Dakota Cowboy Hall of Fame inductees on their honorable accomplishments. Thank you. Now we're moving into the modern era of rodeo. We've got two inductees in this category. And the first one, um, I think Larry Mahan did a pretty good job of introducing her earlier. <laughs> but first one is a former Miss Rodeo America. And her, and Brenda Lee Bonakowski Pickett and Ellen Huber is going to introduce Brenda Lee. Ellen, the stage is yours. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. What a fantastic day to come together to celebrate the achievements of some great cowboys and cowgirls and volunteers in our ranching and rodeo community. I'm privileged to make the introduction of Brenda Lee Bonagoski Pickett. I was reading an article on the way out here today. Um, I think it was a, in a Denver newspaper. Interviewer didn't even want to attempt her last name, and so he just chose to call her Miss Smith, apparently, at the time. But uh, I, I would have to note that it should really be Kay Nelson up here making this introduction because um, Brenda, like so many of, of the rest of us who had the honor to serve as Miss Rodeo North Dakota, were assisted greatly by Kay. And uh, it was Kay's drive and determination to get Brenda inducted into the North Dakota Cowboy Hall of Fame that um, helped to bring together some, some great stories of, of her accomplishments. And so... I'm honored to do this today. I, I also serve on the board of the Miss Rodeo North Dakota Pageant Association and a couple years ago attempted to put together some history on 60 years of, of the young women who had served as Miss Rodeo North Dakota. And so we have, um, shameless plug, just 10 copies of that book remaining and I brought those with me today for anybody that would um, like those. You can sure catch me after the inductions. But I want to talk to you about the, the cowgirl that we're inducting here today. She's a a tremendous combination of substance and style. Certainly many Miss Rodeo North Dakotas are known for their, their great beauty, um, but it's so much about so much more than a wave and the presentation of, of flags and clearing stock from the arena. Brenda Lee Bonagoski Pickett was a, a fabulous ambassador for the sport of rodeo. I and mean, she's a real cowgirl too. She grew up on a ranch in the heart um, River Bottoms in, in Carson, where they raise Semitol cattle. 
She was a goat tire, a barrel racer, and a breakaway roper. And after her time as, as Miss Rodeo North Dakota and Miss Rodeo America, she went on to earn a championship in the breakaway roping in the North Dakota Rodeo Association. On her path to becoming Miss Rodeo North Dakota, she was crowned Miss Rodeo Carson in 1981 and went on to represent North Dakota throughout uh, the Western United States, attending many rodeos and, and promoting our great state during that time. In 1983, she became the first Miss Rodeo North Dakota to be named Miss Rodeo America. Um, just a couple of um, her highlights during that year, she recounts having the opportunity to have met President Reagan, and as well, one of her um, fun stories that you'll find in that um, book was about being asked about some pink lame pants that she was wearing one time and saying, oh, those were something old barrel racers used to wear, not realizing that Martha Josie was standing nearby. <laughs> During her time as Miss Rodeo America, when she wasn't traveling, she served as the hostess for the Pro Rodeo Hall of Fame in Colorado Springs, and as I understand it, stayed with the Nguyen's family in, in Colorado during that time, and so we're um, pleased that they're here today to join in the, in the celebration. Brenda went on to earn degrees in psychology and counseling and has been a mental health therapist in uh, private practice near their home in, in Idaho. And she and Dee Pickett have three children. I know that their daughter Carson is here today, love the name. And so it gives me great honor to bring forward, to accept her award, Brenda Lee Bonagoski Pickett. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, honored guest, Larry Mahan, your rodeo highness, wherever you are. That's what he told me to call him last night. And congratulations to my fellow inductees. It is so good to be back home. Uh, since the inductees were announced last month, my family's had quite a bit of fun at my expense. You know, things like, hey, Miss Hall of Famer, or, you know, Miss Hall of Famer, those weeds aren't going to pull themselves, or my personal favorite when I overheard my husband tell our friends, you know, I'm sleeping with a Hall of Famer. <laughs> <sighs> Aside from all the teasing, I began to reflect what this honor means, and I mean really means to me. And the word and the feeling that kept coming up was gratitude. Gratitude to be included. Gratitude for family and friends. And gratitude to be born in the West. As I walk through the, hall, through the Hall of the Honorees and I read the names of the past inductees enshrined in the North Dakota Cowboy Hall of Fame, I am completely and utterly humbled to be included in the company of women like Evelyn Nguyen's, Virginia Eck, Sakakawea. Um, it, it's almost beyond my comprehension. My own family has been represented in the hall when my cousin, Jerry Weinberger, was inducted in 2014. And I heard at his induction that he was rendered speechless. Now, if any of you know my cousin, Jerry, that's pretty hard to believe. This is the man that when he learned I named my daughter Carson, told a crowd of people, Oh, well, it's a good thing you didn't grow up in Flasher. <laughs> Gratitude for the love and support of my family and friends, and without all of that, this would seem a bit hollow. Um, I wish to thank my husband, Dee, and my beautiful daughter, for allowing me to reign as their queen for all these years. Honey, this is where you're supposed to practice your queenie wave, I taught you. <laughs> I also want to thank my, Heidi, my sister Heidi uh, and nephews Nick and Dom who traveled all the way up here from Colorado. And I have to share with you that we really did abuse my sister at a young age by making her the shoot help she wanted nothing more to do with roping after that, and do you blame her? 
The outpouring of love and support from the family and friends that are here is, who have traveled so far, like the McGarvins and the Newans, means so much. I have 47 first cousins, and some of them have traveled as far today as Virginia, Michigan, and Washington to be here. The pride, the kindness, and the affection that my rodeo family and friends have shown has truly made this an honor. I think I speak for past and current inductees when I say this makes us all realize it's really not about us. It's about something much bigger than us. It's about something uh, honoring a lifestyle that we all love and hold dear to our hearts. And last, gratitude to be born and raised in the great tradition of our great state of North Dakota. Growing up, our family ranch was dead middle uh, on the Heart River between the towns of Elmont and Carson. So having relatives in both communities, I'm a cross between the tough Norwegians of Elmont and the fun-loving Germans of uh, Carson. And they say that youth is wasted on the young, and it was on me. As a 20-year-old, the enormity of the community uh, support that I received was lost on me. I mean, we were in a recession in the early 80s, and times were tough for everyone. But my family and my friends made sure that I had a truck, trailer, and gas money to get down the road. 25 people from my hometown traveled all the way to Oklahoma City on a whim that we could win. And I know several of those people are here today. Wow. I would also like to acknowledge one other special person who basically you could say is responsible for all of this. And when you look up the word lady, the word Kay Nelson's name would be included. She was one of our first Miss Rodeo North Dakotas and she set the bar high for the rest of us. With class and steely determination, this extraordinary woman improves anything she puts her hands to, including me. As a 19-year-old college student working at Nguyen's Western Store, she virtually changed my life forever when she introduced herself and asked if I'd consider running for the title of Miss Rodeo North Dakota. Since then, I have strove to become what she saw and she had encouraged in me. Besides that, has anyone here ever tried saying no to that lady? <laughs> that dog don't hunt. Seriously, Kay, where are you? Where's Kay? Would you please stand up? Yeah. I want to say thank you for the bottom of my heart for all these years of support and love. Thank you. I would like to conclude by sh sharing with you parts of a speech that I gave in 1981 in Oklahoma City while I was competing for the Miss Rodeo America pageant. It's how I felt then, and it's how I feel now. Ever and always, wrote Clell Gannon, a North Dakota poet, I shall love the land. And this also expresses my personal feelings about my state. For I've stood and I've heard the first sweet metal arc of spring and I've stood on the river bottoms of our ranch and listened to the wind go through the cottonwoods. I've ridden through the badlands and I've felt the spirit of Teddy here and I've seen the prairie roses blooming on the plains with which seems a message direct from God. Dear friends, if you remember one thing of which I've spoken today, I hope that it is my feelings of gratitude. I wish to thank the trustees who nominated me the board, Rick Thompson, and the countless individuals who unselfishly give of their time, effort, and resources to make the North Dakota Cowboy Hall of Fame what it is today. Thank you, and may God bless us all. The next honoree in the modern era rodeo category is Denver Jorgensen. And to introduce Den Denver Jorgensen, I'm going to ask Don Schmidt to come to the microphone. Get up here, Don. About two weeks ago, I got a text message from Rick Thompson 
and uh, he asked me if I would be interested in introducing Denver. And I, I think I sent back two words, humbled and honored. Uh, Denver and I go back about 48 years. I was just figuring that up the other night. And I can read his bio and you'd all understand, I mean, the number of championships that Denver won come down to one thing, and that's competition. Uh, Denver thrived on it. He rose to the top competing. He put forth his best efforts, and it was always 110% when he hit that arena. Denver also approached life that way. And, you know, he's, he's a very dear, dear person. He's going to join a group of people in this Hall of Fame that were my heroes, and fortunately enough, they were my friends. And I'm very pleased and honored to have Denver join that group. Uh, besides that, Denver, I, I probably still, you still owe me some money from all those competitions that we uh, had. I, I know you took a lot of my money back then. And uh, he's got a wonderful bride of 43 years in Bobby, and a wonderful son, JD. Uh, you have to say this, that Denver gave it 110% all the way through, and he still is. And I'm just very proud and honored to say that Denver's going to go into the Hall of Fame. I'll give you Denver Jorgensen. Good afternoon. It's an honor for me to be standing up here today. Would the Jorgensen family please come up? I would like to start uh, introducing the Jorgensen family, my wife Bobby, and son JD, and his friend Megan, and our grandchildren Micah and Ophelia. Dale's wife Barbara is on this side, their family, Tim and his wife Sue. Oh, yeah, there you are. Raise your hand. <laughs> uh, Shane and Jocelyn, Tom and his friend Patty and Tom's son, Seth. <laughs> My brother, Nevada, and his wife, Wendy. Cody and Tara. Bennett, Gracia, and Brecken. Leanne and Lee Weisbeck. Daughters, Ambry and Hava. Also, we'd like to mention my sister, Kathy, and brother, Lyle, who uh, are not able to be here today. Uh, Bobby's family and, and our good friends in the audience, and we are happy to have you here. Thank you. Finally, the two people responsible for this rodeo family, our parents, Carl and Helen Jorgensen. They were members of the 50 year in the saddle club. Uh, Dad competed in uh, calf roping, team roping, and was a pickup man. Ma, my mom is now 101 and a half years old, years young, I should say. She loves rodeo and always enjoyed watching her boys compete. In my rodeo career, I competed in bareback riding, saddle bronc, and steer wrestling, and sometimes bull riding. Bobby and JD were always by my side as we traveled the rodeo circuit. We would work all week, pick up, pack up the pickup and trailer, and we're off for the weekend to rodeos. My brother Dale was a big influence and support during those, those years. He and Nevada helped me whenever they could. Dale cannot, could not be here today. You can be sure he'll be watching the video, so I have to be a little careful about my stories I'm telling. One of the most important lessons Dale taught me involved the hula hoop. We were running steers at J Dale's ranch and uh, I had gotten hurt the week before steer wrestling. And I was a little sore so we run four or five head by and I wasn't getting down. And of course that didn't make it so Dale said I can fix that. I said oh okay. He left for a couple minutes and come back and we run the next steer 
where I should have been getting down, I wasn't. He reached over at the hula hoop and pulled me right out, right over under the stair. <laughs> Needless to say, I didn't have any problems getting off after that. <laughs> and we had a good laugh over that. Uh, speaking of trouble, Dale's dog and team trouble, and Andy were the were the best horses, best dog and team around. A lot of prize money was went off the back of them horses, and uh, they were just outstanding. And if there's a a hall of fame for horses, single horses or dog and teams, I think they should be in there. They were a good team. Some of the outstanding outstanding rough stock in them days were Tom Collins, Bobby Sox. Anchors Away, Crow Woman, Montana Rose, Zebra Dunn, Queenie, Gray Eagle, and Red Pepper. I got another short story here. We were in Minnesota going to a rodeo and uh, we were entered up in the usual events, and Dale and I walked back to see the, dog, the steer wrestling steers. Got by and back to the pen and looked at them, and here they had Scotty Highlander cows with calves on them. So we uh, kind of looked at each other a little funny, but and they could really run hard. If you can imagine, their bags full of milk. We were covered with milk by the time we got the cows down. <laughs> milk was everywhere. Our rodeo miles added up over years, along with friendships and memories. It's a good thing that we can still laugh about the mishaps and the good fortunes. The rodeo community is made up of towns, committees, contractors, supporters, and fans, and the competitors with their families. They are the reason we are all here and why our North Dakota heritage is so strong. Thank you to the North Dakota Hall of Fame trustees. This is an honor. I am proud to be inducted in the Cowboy Hall of Fame. It, it's a very humbling experience. Well, last but not least, we have a special achievement award, and this year the uh, honoree in that category is the White Earth Valley Saddle Club. And to introduce the White Earth Valley Saddle Club, I'm, br I'm going to bring the president of the board, Jim Chamley, back to the microphone. Oh, our next uh, inductee, uh, the White of Valley Saddle Club and Ro Saddle and Rodeo Club, uh, pretty de dear to my heart because I was just a, probably a eighth grade, might have been a freshman in high school somewhere there about 1956 is when the organization was formed and uh, uh, our family was always involved, but this is kind of funny. I, I found out today, uh, this morning, from the last uh, founding member uh, in the club, uh, Carl Freisinger, that uh, my dad was always around and helping and involved and, and helped build the arena and picking up and so forth, but he never did join the club. And I just found that out this morning. And uh, it cost $25 lifetime to join the club. And I, I, I don't suppose we ever had $25 to put together and join the club. So anyway, I'm glad I joined here a few years ago so that at least I'm giving the Chamley name a little honor there, guys. But anyway, I'm, I'm proud to be a member of the club. They started their first rodeo in 1957. Uh, run for 50 years an NDRA rodeo and uh, then switched over to the Rough Rider for the last 10 years and they just finished last weekend with their uh, 60th year 
and uh, give them a hand. I mean, that's, a, that's quite an accomplishment right there. So. Well represented here today. They're just look up and down that table there. There they are. And they're all involved. They're, they have their meeting the first Monday of every month. And if I'm in the country, I always try to make it. And uh, they're a hardworking, uh, dedicated bunch of individuals. So uh, you, can't, you can't all speak now. We, get, we can only have two of you speak. But uh, I'm, I'm going to, I'm sure you got a lot to tell and so forth. And I'm not going to steal your thunder. So uh, who's ever representing the club today, uh, would you come up to the microphone, please? Thank you, Jim, very much, and, and it's a great honor and a privilege uh, to be here in uh, respect for the White Oak Valley Saddle Club. It's um, a club that we started back uh, in the summer of 1956. I, uh, myself, was working in the oil field, and a young man come up to me and he said, uh, I'm living in a tent, he said, down in the White Oak Valley. And he said, I got uh, two horses and a wife. He said, I'd like to bring up here. He said, I think I found a personal job. Well, I said, I got a place for your horses. But I said, your wife will have to stay in the tent with you. Well, after several coffee breaks and whatnot, he said, you know, he said, I used to do a little roping and team roping and calf roping. And... Uh, he said, I think this would be a world of wonderful place in this White Valley to start a roping club. So, things went on, you know. First thing you know, an old cowboy, Frank Crimmins, saddle bronc rider, come to our club. He said, I think, you know, he said, this valley is more entitled to just a roping club. He said, I think it should be a rodeo. So, we started having meetings and putting things together. Didn't have no money, of course. And uh, finally, we got in touch with the board of directors down at Old Sanish, where the garrison dam had flooded out the arena. And they said, uh, we'll donate these chutes to you if you put them to a good use. Frank Crimmins, he jumped for that. He said, we'll be there and get them. So we went along. We went down on the river bottom, we cut a bunch of old ash trees and made the round pen. Went to Elbow Woods, the cottonwood lumber yard down there and picked up some slabs and started building the pins for the bulls and whatnot. That was kind of the way we got started. And uh, we went along and uh, I guess, you know, we, the White Earth Valley Saddle Club is really proud to be inducted into this Cowboy Hall of Fame. Uh, I didn't have no, nothing wrote down, so I'm just going to bring you a few of the memories that come out of the top of my head. And one of the most exciting memories was one time me and her dad, Frank Crimmins, and another member, Charles Slimmons' dad, was putting a roof on the crow's nest, or the announcer stand, I guess they call it now. Big old black cloud gathered up in the west, and it started the lightning and thundering, and old Mother Nature was roaring at us. Frank said, uh, when that first raindrop hits, he said, I'm heading for the grandstand. I said, I'll follow you. Well, we got to the grandstand and kaboom! Lightning hit the crow's nest where we was been working. Frank looked at me and he said, "Ain't you glad we left?" <laughs> I guess that, that's about all the memories I have about the White Earth Saddle Club. But I want to thank this the, for being inducted into this Cowboy Hall of Fame. Thank you. Uh, what happened to our president, John? Here, Did you? Here you are. Uh, this is our president, and we would like to have. In first, I'd like to say thank you to the Hall of Fame.
Thank you to all the board members, the inductees. Thank you to my cousin, Jim Chamley, my brother, Ike Crimmins. This is an honor, and thank you from up above, all of you who started this. I'd like all the club members to work your way up here and please uh, come up to the stand. But uh, I'd like to thank the, the board and the trustees for the nominating. And, and the, like everybody said today, this is a humbling experience. You know, uh, nobody wants to listen to me. That's what happens when you're the boss. Nobody listens. <laughs> but this lady right here, she had a lot of blisters and a lot of calluses from tamping them posts that her dad and, and, and Carl cut down there to build that arena. I mean, these were the kids, Jim Chamley and, 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 and Ike. Ike and you and there was, I had four people that I, and your sister, Joyce. Yeah. You know, th these were the kids. So that's what t uh, you young girls over there that don't know what's, I'm not 60 yet, but I'm getting close. But uh, this is what, what 60 years does. And uh, we were lucky. Um, this is, we've, been, we've been working uh, to get into the, to the, the Hall of Fame, not because of what we've done, but what these guys have done. And it's, it's being in, in our special achievement is different than a, as an individual. And uh, to go out there and, and continue to put the efforts in, and, and nobody's still coming up here to be beside me, but um, you know, to me, the, the last roughly 10 years I've been involved in the White Earth Valley Saddle Club, I put 110% in, and so do these guys. Not for ourselves, but for those that had built it before us. And so it's an honor and a privilege, not for me, but it's for Pat and her brother and her family that came forward and, and, and helped build such a beautiful place in the awesome White Earth Valley. Thank you, guys. What a day, huh? I hope everybody has enjoyed it as much as we have. And uh, the next event that we have at the Cowboy Hall of Fame, that we're open every day. So hope people come by and go through the hall and, and enjoy what's there. The next major event is the National Day of the Cowboy, and that's July 21st and 22nd. We've got at the hall, we've got uh, Greg Hager, uh, and we've got Cowboy pro Poetry with Fran Armstrong and Jonathan Oderman on uh, July 22nd. Greg is a, sings, is a singer and he'll be there on July 21st and 22nd. We've got our booth at the, at the uh, North Dakota State Fair every year and it's in the same place this year as it was last year, right Connie? And I guess that's down by the dairy barn for you folks that know where that is. And stop by and say hello. Uh, Ed and Connie Sunby and the District 5 people from up around Minot have the saddle raffle. They have raffle tickets available. If you haven't had a chance to purchase those yet, stop by and see them. Like I said, the posters are available. Uh, don't forget to join the North Dakota Cowboy Hall of Fame. And let's give everybody a round of applause, all the inductees today. There'll be pictures out here by the flags for the inductees and their families and whoever wants to join them, whoever is an invited guest of theirs. So feel free and stick around and linger and visit as long as you'd like. And thanks a lot for everyone coming. <laughs>